are a number of discoveries that set back the whole movement to gather our data together by years because we discovered, among other things, that there was a whole lot of crap in our data, that it was poorly managed by hospitals and doctors, but to some extent that wasn't really their fault because the processes to do a competent job didn't exist yet. Uh, and along the way, over the course of that summer in 2009, uh, I got, I, I blogged about the, the garbage I found and I, the Boston Globe newspaper called and they wrote about my blog post and put it on page one and I started getting invited to policy meetings in Washington and I was like, what? What's going on here? I'm a random blogger from Nashua, New Hampshire, you know what I mean? Uh, but one thing led to another and uh, over the course of that summer, Gunther Eisenbach, who I think is out of the room at the moment, invited me to give the opening keynote at his conference in sep that September 2009. And he, my life was spinning out of, the con out of control. I, in less than a year, I would no longer have a job because I was spending too much time in Washington and all kinds of things. And so when he said a question that I, now I make my living as a keynote speaker, but I'd never been asked this. He said, what do you want your speech to be called? We have to put it in the brochure. And the third time he asked it, I said, I don't know, just call it, give me my damn data, because you guys can't be trusted. <laughs> I thought it would be a temporary title, but it stuck. <laughs> and now, as some of you know, there's a three minute rock video by Ross Martin and his garage band, uh, and there are t-shirts and coffee mugs and all kinds of things. The reason I bring this up is this has been a foundational issue, one of several, but a foundational issue for this society and it is my personal experience now, over the past year, that something important has changed in the world of health IT. It's, this is something, I remember Keith Boone here told me about years ago, but I couldn't comprehend it. For six or seven years now, a standards organization called HL7, and they actually apologized recently for the fact that HL7 doesn't really mean anything, it's an indication of how geeky they are, but I mean, power, power to the nerds, right? This is bits and bites. And the, anyway, they've been working on the standard called FHIR, F-H-I-R, Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources, is that correct? Yes. Uh, Keith, yes. Close enough. Close enough, okay, well, good. Anyway, we all know, most of us know about Regina Holiday's walking gallery of healthcare and the fact that she's inviting other artists to participate to put something about their healthcare experience on jackets. And I, I felt so pulled, so compelled to get involved in FIRE that last year uh, I bowled my way in. I said, you gotta let me speak. I'll buy my own plane ticket to Amsterdam to the Developer Days Conference, paid my own expenses, and then I, anyway, and then I had my wife paint the FIRE logo on the back of my jacket. <laughs> All right. So for those of you who've been following, because I believe that after six or seven years of HL7 doing this work, we are finally at the point where the plumbing and wiring are in place enough to actually do the horrifically complicated stuff that's going to be necessary to bring our data together. The work is not finished. You can think about the early web where there wasn't a whole lot you could do with websites. But as the great Susanna Fox, one of the real patron saints of our society, said in a blog post earlier this week, don't denigrate the early technology. Look for the potential, right? Because that's what's starting to happen. What the early web could do has little in common with what we can all do today uh, and that's what I believe you're going to see. Now, this is all by way of introducing our final keynote of the day. This gentleman is Brian Haney, who works in uh, near South Station. Come on up, Brian. Uh, and in addition to the HL7 organization, there is a, what would you say, Firely is kind of a commercialization company. They run the Developer Days Conference. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and they provide some tools in the fire space. Uh, that, that some of you might know if you're in that space, so, but uh, they're, they're based in Amsterdam and, and we're helping them uh, make a presence here in Boston. Yes, his, his company with the charming name Vermonster <laughs> uh, is in, in South Station, the South Station area, and has just been named the Boston Office of Fire. 
And we're going to close today uh, with a talk from Brian. We're going to talk about for 15 or 20 minutes and then have as much time as uh, discussion as we have time for. So welcome, Brian King. Thank you. Glad that the last talk of the day is about a, a, a technical specification. So I'm very interested in Onion and their seats. Um, also, like uh, uh, to, to remind everyone, this is uh, um, extension tax day. So if you file your extension today, uh, I found out the good news this morning. Um, so uh, I'm Brian. Uh, I work at a company called Monster. It's, it's actually in the um, uh, post office square area, but close enough to South Station. Um, and uh, we've been in business since the early 2000s, and I've been personally doing health IT stuff in the last 15 years. Um, I uh, really didn't think much about health and, and healthcare, um, although I do have uh, some uh, relationship to it on a first hand basis. My, my father was uh, um, a type 1 uh, diabetic, he was diagnosed when he was like four. Um, and so just living through, uh, you know, doctor's visits and, and seeing what my mother had to do to, to manage the information and, and kind of keep filing cabinets at home of information about how his uh, condition was, was uh, progressing through, through his lifetime. And then, um, uh, so that was kind of when I was in college that was going on. And then, and then a little later in life, I started uh, just kind of fell into health IT and I, uh, wrote some decision support software uh, in the oncology space and le learned a lot about how, how that whole thing works. And, and I, my mother was diagnosed with breast cancer, so I was able to follow all of the guidelines. And at that point, I was able to get some of the information uh, that, that, that was relevant to, to kind of understanding what, what she was going through. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so I'm here to talk about FIRE, but I, I think there's a lot of overlap in the culture of what the FIRE community is this group is doing. Um, so if we think about an artist in, in her subject, uh, th there's a representation of that, that subject in, in, in the art. And I think when, when we think about data, uh, there's, there's kind of a similar idea. And, and I think um, if we look at, and some you know, people have mentioned the, the GDPR before, that they even have these legal terms. They have like a data controller. This is like the company that's dealing with the information, the data subject. That's like the person or patient or the person visiting the website. And um, GDPR uh, sets forth a bunch of regulations and uh, uh, rights that, that uh, people have. And um, you hear that this is, this is happening uh, in, in Europe right now. Um, and I think a lot of people don't, don't think about uh, uh, kind of side effects of using services. So I don't know if anyone reads uh, uh, Drew Schneider's blog, but he's got a, a very uh, well-read security blog, and he talks about like um, like just uh, thinking thinking about security and, and information in, in our age. And uh, his book uh, here, uh, Data and Black, talks about kind of all this data control, all this information that we're volunteering to, to these uh, organizations as a side effect for using their services. And we all know kind of who they are, so, so I don't really need to, to, to dwell on that. Um, but what this can lead to uh, is an increased disparity uh, in who has access to information and overall less diversity. And so uh, if you're, uh, say, a startup or trying to get, uh, um, uh, say, say you have a great idea, but you need access to data to try and like vet it out or perhaps do some machine learning or you just want information for your own personal uh, use, um, there's a lot less diversity when, when there's these kind of data um, monopolies. And, and we know uh, from reading over the years that um, a monoculture can, can wipe out a whole species. Um, and we also know that there's been studies, uh, companies and organizations that have a more diverse group of people, more people thinking about ideas, actually are more effective and, and even make more money. So, so we, we like to, to have uh, diversity and, and when, when our data is, is in a less diverse state, and less accessible, but, um, it's not as, as, as optimum as, as if, it, if it were more. Um, so let's talk a little bit about healthcare data. Um, so I did some research, and apparently the first EHR came out in the 1950s. Um, around that same time, uh, this thing called EDI came out. In Holland, America was like a shipping company, so it was like a logistics uh, way, that, and, and this was a way to exchange information electronically. And so these were huge uh, payloads of data 
They were manually like cranked out um, like on a, a, a slow basis, maybe get information every month. And this is the underpinning of what a lot of the way healthcare still exchanges data. They use the same format, and, it, and it's um, it's basically a, a, a large amount of information uh, in these kind of EDI-like uh, uh, packages, these monolithic documents that get transferred from one organization or transferred from one organization to another. Um, and a lot of that is, is really like business to business. And so uh, what happens if you're like a customer, well, or a consumer of this information, and if you haven't set up all this infrastructure to support these giant EDI document uh, monstrosities going around, uh, it's gonna be hard for you to have access to that information. What if you have cool ideas and you wanna build new products or new services, or you, or you wanna innovate? Um, that Again, that information is kind of blocked to you. So this like, um, uh, nature of like the, the, the culture of how this information gets exchanged has kind of naturally built up um, a series of like these uh, data silos. And anyone who's kind of in uh, technology probably has heard of Conway's Law, which basically says that the uh, social constructs of how your organization works repre is represented uh, in the, the, the way the systems are built. And so if we're kind of thinking about this culture of closed and protectiveness of, of data, and not sharing it uh, readily, um, we're gonna end up in, in this kind of this, this situation. And our, our only recourse has been really, you know, the taxes are still used. Um, we're seeing a, you know, more DHR adoption over the years because of government kind of pressures and mandates, but um, you know, as a consumer, we, we didn't really have the opportunity until recently in human history to kind of get this information. Um, and so, you know, as a doctor is, is kind of uh, talking to a patient and, and back to from kind of my mother's experience, like sitting in the room trying to listen to it and take notes, like that was kind of our only way that we could participate in medicine. It was very difficult. So, meanwhile, uh, from the slightly after 1960s, um, this, uh, this ARPANET internet thing came about. And so a lot of that actually had its roots here in this area. And um, this was a, a way to kind of build interconnected systems that the information can get transferred uh, more quickly. So it's not just a giant payload of information on a weekly basis, um, known as the internet, World Wide Web, and, and kind of this, this semantics. Um, and the way the, uh, Kimberly Lee thought about this was, was like a series of, of interconnected resources. So if you need to get information about something and you request it, it'd be like a document and you build a capture. And all these things could have hyperlinks between them. And it built a nice kind of uh, uh, semantic nature to information uh, on, on top of this kind of uh, backbone of, of being able to, to have interconnected systems. Um, and so as a user, as a human, you might like go to a website and ask for information and then some sort of response. So it's like this, this very lightweight request response cycle. And this is kind of built into how we view most web and APIs today. And an API is, is basically you swap out the, the human asking for information, you put a computer there, and that gives us the ability to, to, to create apps and have things done in a lightweight way. So now we're kind of APIs versus EDI, but APIs are just a way that we can now more readily access this information. Um, and APIs are used all the time to buy airline tickets to, to all phones or all apps you have on your phone probably have an API kind of behind the scenes that, that are providing the information, um, e-commerce. And so it's a very elegant, nice way to think about structuring information on in this kind of web. Um, so, Max, who he goes by, was a creator of this uh, programming language called Ruby um, back in the early 90s. And, and his, his passion was about creating a language that uh, promoted happiness. So designers and developers of software would be happy because when we're happy and not stressed out, we're more creative. Uh, it was a really nice language. It was one of my first languages that I really enjoyed and used professionally. Um, but it was really kind of uh, uh, expanded in popularity because of um, this uh, this guy, DHH, he goes by. And so he created this framework called Ruby on Rails. And he embraced this whole idea of, of having a semantic web of, of reference of resources that you can easily uh, reference. 
And um, when we look at like uh, this slide from 2014, uh, Graham Breeze, one of the creators of, of, of the FIRE framework, referenced the uh, uh, iRise for 37 Signals. So this was DHH's, 37 Signals was his company. And so uh, when, when 37 Signals uh, decided to embrace REST, uh, Graham took a look at this and said, this is, this is what we should build FIRE on, because these are all small addressable resources. These aren't this huge monolithic document that you need uh, lots of paper working and uh, heavy machinery to, to process. Let's use these, this, this lightweight um, uh, way that, that uh, he was inspired by what was, what was already out there. Um, and so uh, in the early, I guess, 2010s, late, whatever you call the 2000s, before the uh, knots, the hots, knots, <laughs> in that time, uh, HL7 was going through kind of a standards kind of refresh, and they, and they tried different things. There's, they're, without getting too much into the detail, they were trying to migrate away from this EBI structure. They looked at some XML formats, and then they created this kind of fresh look task force in 2000, around 2000. And during that time, uh, just some key things to point out is, is the, the between then and now, I mean, it, 10 years seems kind of like a long time, but it's not really, especially in the standards world, especially in healthcare. Um, we've seen so much of it. We've seen uh, different industry groups forming uh, around the standard. Uh, we've seen Apple, uh, like now you can get your health records on your phone. Uh, and so uh, that came out of this kind of community of thinking. Uh, cloud vendors like Google and, and, uh, and Azure and AWS are all kind of on board and, and seeing fire as a way forward. And then most recently, earlier this year, the, the ONC and CMS has, has really started this uh, um, kind of known as data blocking uh, proposal or data unblocking proposal that uh, would allow or penalize uh, if uh, organizations didn't give patients access to their, to their data. So all of this kind of came out of this simple idea of like, let's not use, let, let, let's make this information, let's make this data more accessible to more um, and we even see things like the, the, uh, the, the healthit.gov website has a whole section on like how you could access your information uh, um, and, and, how you, and, and how you could go about getting that from your health providers. Um, and a lot of this is based on uh, accessing <coughs> information through your, your patient portal. So most people uh, probably have a patient portal uh, through their healthcare provider. Uh, one of the things that the regulations are mandating is that that information that you see on your screen, on your phone, th through their website, also has to be provided to you through this FIRE API. Um, and that's e exactly how the, uh, the, the Google work, or the, uh, the, I or the Apple workflow works. So you can ask for your health records, and then behind the scenes, this whole dance to get your information uh, available on your phone uh, is using this, this FIRE thing. Um, and uh, you know, it's not just Apple. We, you know, just recently there, there's this group called Common Health that's come out that's going to do the same thing for Android devices. So we should see that in the coming uh, coming few months. Um, but I, I guess I'd like to just take a step back. I, you know, I, I don't think Fire really is what I call an API, and, and I guess the reason why I, I'm saying that is because. Um, it, it, it's actually been a disruptive change to a lot of things. So this is, uh, Renee Spronk is actually a colleague of mine. He's, he's at, uh, at Firely, and um, uh, actually, I think I got this tweet off of your blog post, uh, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, but you know, the, this this was a big change. So HL7, this, the standard body is sort of 2012, yeah. Yeah, they, they decided to, um, uh, stop charging a licensing fee for their standards and, and make this open. And this all came about uh, in part, the big catalyst of this was fire, because I think Graham said that I think it, this, this had been going on for numerous years. And so I was one of those working that just broke it down. Fire was a small part of this. Fire was a small part of this, is what I meant to say. But this is, this is all happening around the, the same the same time. Um, and I think the FIRE uh, community has, we see a lot more things on uh, 
being developed out in the open on things like GitHub, um, and, and that, that didn't exist before Fire, whether that's a coincidence, uh, a coincidence because of timing or not. Um, also, uh, I think someone on the panel uh, mentioned Gravity. That's one of these accelerator programs that, um, fi that Fire and HL7 is building. So, so there's other ones. Agronauts about the EHR vendors using Fire. Karen's about payers and pay being able to get access to patients for their uh, information about um, uh, about uh, the kind of payment side. And Da Vinci is, is more about uh, payers uh, to payers, I think, or payers to providers. Um, so, so there's all these groups that, that, are, that are coming out. And, and we even saw, like, um, in, in the Fire ecosystem, the CDC at, at the last dev days uh, talked about doing a Kaizen event where they went through and they said, okay, uh, how can we use these, these standards, these open way, this, this open way of using information to, to address a crisis? And, and they kind of uh, made one up with, with, like, what if there was an anthrax crisis? And they went through the process of how they could build guidelines and distribute them out to the public in an efficient, fast way, not over 20 years if we're trying to uh, address an active epidemic. Um, and, and a lot of that is because of this kind of underpinning supplier. Um, I think that uh, we're, we're gonna be okay if there's, a, if there's ever a ZA, a zombie apocalypse. Um, and there's these things called connectathons, and I have not seen this anywhere, like where people can come together and if you want to sit side by side with someone like the lead developer at one of the biggest EHRs in the country and ask them questions because you're working on a project as a startup, it's totally open and it's just it's this vibrant community around just trying to make the space better and this information more accessible. So, so I, I know a lot of the big vendors get kind of a bad rap, but everyone that I've seen at these connectathons have been extremely open and curious and very interested and, and genuinely interested in, in progressing uh, this, this stuff forward. Um, and then there's the Dev Days events. So, so uh, Dave was at the, the one uh, that you mentioned last year. There was one here in Boston years ago. The last the few months ago, there's one in Seattle. So there's two a year, one in the US, one in Europe. There's one coming up in November. Um, so if you want to go to that. Um, and I think there's a, a patient track that's, that's happening. Can we talk to them one of the three point network? I'm, I'm at the point where I'm sort of, sort of start doing a little back and forth because the um, uh, I want to say I know some of this is very deep in the weeds and hard to understand from our perspective. What I want you to hear though, what I want you to hear is that some things are starting to happen that Brian was just describing that go way, way, way beyond what any of us ever thought of when we said like give me my damn data, right? I want to look at my medical records stuff. Um, we saw at this connectathon in Atlanta a few weeks ago, some people sat down and said, now if all this stuff is true, I should be able to talk to this patient's insurance company and find out whether a certain drug is covered and then go find out using fire from their local pharmacies, what it'll cost with that insurance and if there are any alternatives. And boom, 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 in two hours they had working software. Humira is not covered by your insurance. It will cost you $145,000, but there's an alternative that is covered by your insurance. And this was all with no advanced planning, right? So imagine if you can, that what we always thought should be possible to bring all kinds of different information together, right, is starting to become reality. And it, it's beyond my head, my level, how it works. That's why we have Brian. <laughs> Right, and, and when, when my mother was going through her, her, uh, her treatment, uh, I, I remember one of the biggest concerns she had was, was almost less about the disease, it was more about out of pocket cost. And so I, I really think that, uh, um, that being able to have uh, less barriers on, barriers on this information can, can, can uh, address and, and allow people to see exactly uh, where, uh, you know, where, where things are. Um, so. I, I got this off of the um, off of the Supportive Medicine website, and, and I thought this was really nice. So I tried to frame up with you know a fire version of that. I, I think you know it's 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 a lot of people think a fire is an API, but I really think it's a movement to change healthcare, and 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 that's really getting more accessibility to, to more people to this this information, so we don't end up like the bananas. Um, so I mentioned. Uh, 
Dev Days, that's happening in November. Um, uh, Dave might say a quick word on that. Um, and then if you can't convince the boss to uh, pay for a trip to Amsterdam, uh, we have a free event uh, coming November 5th over at the um, Boston Children's has this like uh, innovation thing over at the Landmark Building in, in the Fenway area, if you're familiar with the Boston area. Um, and so if you go meet up and look at Boston Fire, and I think Dave's actually talking there too, so I'm gonna be seeing a lot of Dave. <laughs> Well, and consider this also, the, and it is time to, to move on to discussion, and I hope you won't be afraid to ask questions because we are just at the point, that, yeah, and I'll say we, I, I just officially became a member of HL7 recently. We're just at the point where we're trying to bring this out to where ordinary people can look at it and kick at it and poke it and say, what can I do with this stuff? The, in the Seattle meeting that he mentioned, and I want you to compare this also with other companies and big nonprofit organizations that you've dealt with in health IT, uh, because in Seattle, I was supposed to, to, to sing for my supper. I was supposed to write blog posts about the patient's perspective on all this. And I said to them, HL7 doesn't even have a clear sense of what patient means to them. Uh, and so they said, you know, they're right. And to make a long story short, here we are, like three months later, the HL7 organization has mostly agreed they need an actual patient working group helping run the organization. Like all of the other technology people, they are seriously committed to this. And this means that there will be some of us, and by the way, anybody who wants to can go join chat.fire.org and listen in and participate on the discussions. You can fully participate in anything HL7 is doing if you've got an idea. The, uh, they have no products to sell. This is purely a community. And the only thing you can't do without joining is vote on specifications. So uh, keep your eyes out, keep your eyes out. Start dreaming again of what you would like to do if you could get the, all the information you want together because I think it's gonna to start to become reality over the next few years, the same way the web grew. So, who would like to ask a question or? Softballs only. Uh, <laughs> I, I've been involved in HL7 for years. That was the best presentation on fire I've seen yet. Yeah. Thank you. Actually, I, I agree with what he, what he saying one of the big things that fire is, is aimed at is, is making all these massive systems interoperable and, and one of the questions a lot of us had uh, Seema Verma who's the uh, administrator of CMS was talking about this a lot at the, the IMSS convention last spring one of the things that's a big concern of a lot of people is how is the issue of data security being brought in now that all of this data is becoming massively available to us Right, and I, and I think um, FIRE's kind of, uh, the, the, well, the, the people behind FIRE, kind of their, their, uh, their thinking generally is, is to not um, reinvent new things. And so when it comes to the area of, of like security, um, it, it's really kind of falling back on existing like web security technologies. So a lot of it's built uh, using uh, OAuth 2, which is a proven uh, security protocol that's, that's used widely for, for uh, finance, uh, social media, and, and now health. Um, and then uh, TL, like various uh, cryptographic security that, that's kind of proven in, in, in the field. So, so instead of kind of inventing their own mechanisms, it's leveraging what, what, what is already there. And I think that's, that's good because we don't have to have proprietary new tools. We can use kind of off the shelf tools and machinery to do that. Yeah, um, you're going to tell instantly that I'm not technical, uh, but my question is, if the uh, what kind of vision exists? Can you expand on that a little bit for the consolidation of data? Does it include clinical data, medical records, payment data, uh, right. and patient data, patient uh, right. authored data? Does it encompass all right. that? Right. So, um, the, you know, the, there's a lot of questions there, and, and that's the, the, they're all. Very interesting. Um, there's already kind of a uh, 
a group that, that um, is, is working with the ONC building this kind of US core, they call it, set of uh, clinical facts that, that the government is now making part of the rules that they're proposing. And so that would be like uh, conditions, drugs, allergies, and kind of all that clinical. And that's fairly widely available now through your patient portal. Uh, there's uh, the Karen group is, is working on kind of that on the, on the payment side uh, to patients. Um, and I think that, uh, um, you know, talking to the, you know, some of the folks at the, the kind of the large EHR vendors, this, this whole thing of provenance and like being able to provide uh, wearable data or patient reported data and kind of having that also kind of live in this transactional system that, that you can you can access it is definitely what they're, they're looking towards. But right now it's it's kind of starting with clinical and, and moving to kind of some of the financial Oh, and I, I think an important part here is that the arrival of fire doesn't mean that all the data in the world will be open like the newspaper, like a newspaper, right? But if I give authorization to somebody to get it, the data will be able to flow much more easily than in the past. Is that correct? It, it is, and there's also just time to kind of wire out the data. So depending on what providers you have, they're kind of on their own roadmaps and trying to kind of connect all this. And so it's going to come in uh, <coughs> waves. It, it's not going to immediately turn on, you know, January 1st type of thing. No. Recently, both the American Medical Association, I see you over there, and, and then to read you first, both the American Medical Association and the American Hospital Association issued statements saying they think it's a bad idea to let us get our hands on our data because it might leak. <laughs> now, well, it's true. I mean, yeah, I mean, by that logic, we should stop using credit cards, right? Because the data leaks. And besides, but the other thing about it is that is paternalism. That is, no, 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 you don't understand. I'll make the decision for you, okay? And the participatory response is, excuse me, I'd like to decide that. So uh, Nancy and I, how much time do we have, Danny or somebody? We have Cause two minutes. Two minutes, <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> the, the, we'll set up a booth at the reception afterwards. <laughs> I'm just gonna say the answer, and there are many um, endpoints available to patients today. They're not, not everybody is going to find all of the endpoints available, but they're getting rolled up very quickly, and they're mandated to be rolled out. So that's an ongoing, Point, but I wanted to answer your question on security, that care thing. Um, so the Karen Alliance is really driving a lot of the security, um, po adding policies onto the security standards and defining exactly what they should be. They've added additional NIST levels. I know that's technical, but what that just means is you know another level of security. And then both hard and uh, user managed access are additional things that really focus on patient, the ability of patients direct where the sharing goes. There's a ONC webinar on HART, and also the Contero organization is doing a lot of this work and pulling all this stuff together. Again, all working together with the fire organizations. So Nancy Lush, in case you can't tell, is another member who's deeply involved in the fire project as well. So I encourage all of you who have questions, um, I'll stick around as much as I can after. I Brian, I don't know how much you can. Okay, and again, the Boston Fire Meetup is Tuesday, November 5th. You can just Google Boston Fire Meetup, right, and join the community and so on. I'm eager to get your questions, but we ran out of time because this, I'm so happy that enough of you like this. So, yeah, you, do so, you want to do one more? Yeah, we can do one more. We're, we're going to do a couple more questions. So who was next? I think, uh, I, I think he was. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's happening all over the world. It's, it's definitely a global phenomenon. I, I know a lot of uh, Scandinavian countries, uh, I'm sure, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. I'm going to say, the firemen, the architect of fire yeah. from Australia, yeah. Canada, and Amsterdam. Oh, and the U.S., but he was the late one. Right. <laughs> So he said, for those of you who couldn't hear, he says, look at the UK to see how things are actually working in, in fire. I forgot to mention when Brian handed me the mic earlier, the, not only did the, the HL Suburban Organization create this patient working group, they decided, I looked at the Amsterdam agenda last year and I said, well, we've got a startup track and we've got a student track. 
Why isn't there a track for patient innovators? People want to grab the data and invent things on their own. And they said, yeah, why isn't there? And they not only created one, it'll be November 20th in Amsterdam, but they created a contest for submissions. It was on the SPM blog. We had like a dozen submissions of patients who've come up with product ideas themselves. And four, the top four submissions are getting flown to Amsterdam to compete for the final award. Now that is a quick organizational transformation, right? When the idea of patient involvement is introduced. So that's already real today in the FIRE community. So we have to move on. No, 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 we got more oh, questions. Another, okay. another one, okay. just, just one quick question. In your nightmares, how do you think this might be monetized? In my nightmares? Yes. Yeah, so Why is this a that, nightmare? Well, no, I said, in your darkest thoughts, I mean, who thought that there would be ads on uh, uh, phony news on, on Facebook and all that other kind of stuff? So in your nightmares, how could this be? Oh, how could, you, how could it be misused? Yeah. And monetized, Mon yes. Well, yeah, but that's not, not, that's not a nightmare. <laughs> not to me, right? That's, from her perspective, it is, though. No, the is in, if you were to imagine an evil use of this, what would it be? Oh, well, yeah. sure, that's, but that's no different from any other use, right? We already, the, the, I mean, the real harm, the real Satan in this is Facebook. You know, the, the, if you know about the so-called sick girl vulnerability, where they have a security leak, where people who are pretending to be advertisers can go in and screen scrape the list of names of breast cancer communities, right, and put that in to give that to data aggregators, that that's already a current demonstrated reality. Uh, and that in fact, a real horror show is that some people, there was recently a breast cancer trial, they're always recruiting patients, they unthinkingly decided to use the Facebook login widget as the way to sign up for the clinical trial, thereby giving Facebook the access to the patient's, whatever patient's medical information they posted. So that's already a reality. And I think Brian's answer that HL7 has wisely decided to use other security measures. And, and, and to end on a, on a happier note, um, <laughs> <laughs> one, one of the things that, you know, we're working with a, with a client that, that's, that's um, integrating with patient portals so that patients can get their information out and then they can add, augment that with maybe wearable data and patient reported data. And then they can submit that to a lot of these registries, like the California Cancer Registry, for instance. So this data sharing uh, and, and allowing patients to control who has access using the same protocols and the same kind of technology that, that you use to get the information to begin with, it, you know, ha has a has a huge effect for, for research as well as the individual patient access. And Mary, if you, if you want to dig into that question, the, uh, there's an excellent book called Weapons of Math Destruction. <laughs> <laughs> that is about these analytics engines, yes? I was trying to end on a happy note. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question for you as well. Can I ask a question? Test, test, okay. So I have a question for you, and then I'm going to kick you off the stage. But, but let me ask you this question. I think there's this notion that the medical record is something that's fully encapsulatable. And every time I see a hackathon or something, they're saying, oh, well, you can grab this emergency department visit and this and that. Well, I, I live in the world of primary care. I live in the world of longitudinal care. And I, you know, I see patients over you know, 5, 10, 20, 30 years. And the medical record isn't so easily encapsulatable in that way. And what is FIRE doing to address that issue? And because what you really have to do is you have to grab the record and then you have to grab an incremental update and, and, and so on and so on and so on, which means, of course, you need applications to take in incremental updates. Right. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, and, and I think FIRE is providing the like pieces to make that happen. But like as a society, like we have government, whether you like government or not, but government does things like prevent the like, uh, uh, you know, coal fire plant from dumping coal in the air next to your house. And so we have, the government is starting to compel these health organizations to use this fire standard to make the, all this data more shareable. Sure. But that didn't answer my question. I'm gonna well, push no, it. No, fire is, and the government is using, I'm saying that we're relying on like government agency to, you know, the ONC to, to kind of compel and make 
because uh, you're right, you might, your specialty doctor will only have a bit of your patient record and you might have more information in a, in a different system. You're not gonna get all of that at once, but over time, because of the incentives and the penalties for not complying with kind of the, the so law. So the information's right? available, but it needs to be grabbed and sort of aggregated. So if we wanted to get Dave's record, he's, how long have you been coming to me, Dave? 2002. Okay, so since 2002. Mm -hmm. So I can grab a piece of that record, but I've got to sort of piece it together over time. We're going to keep grabbing. Go ahead. So, answer me. Uh, so let me see if this is a correct answer. Fire is not a set of functionality that doesn't exist yet. Fire is a way of moving the data around so that other apps can do things to it. Yes? Yeah. So is that... And, and so it's sort of your, your question is kind of like saying, well, what are smartphones going to do to simplify airfares? <laughs> no, no, no. Well, no, it, 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 it is. Smartphones will enable apps that let you shop for airfares. But, but, but we're talking about fire as a, a policy for getting one's record. Um, it's a standard. It's a standard. Well, well, and well, well, what I meant is fire is the policy refers to fire. Fire itself is not a policy. Right, right, right. right. I'm just saying these are issues that we've got to address as we talk about the, you know, what is the record. But that's all I wanted to say. Right, but the record is, is, is a polyglot, a whole bunch of pieces of that. So, so these are outstanding problems for the patient workers in HL7. Uh, <laughs> There's a flag. And, okay, and I think you should become a member. <laughs> in my spare time, that's right. Nothing like heated confusion. Give it up for Brian, <laughs> Katie, and Dave. Thank you. Um, next uh, on the agenda, first of all, I have an announcement because announcements are important. Uh, one of our speakers has lost his or her wallet. And I would like you to look under your tables and look next to you. I don't have a descriptor of the wallet. Um, but if there's a wallet that's around, yeah, you know, it's probably not supposed to be under your table. So just check. And if there is a wallet, please uh, bring it in. If you find a wallet, please bring it to me. I'd rather... All right, so keep an eye out for a wallet. Next is my great pleasure, and I, I think that, uh, Amber, I think your computer should be coming up here before you do. <laughs> Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce the next piece of our conference as we're in the home stretch. Um, so it, I, it's my great pleasure to introduce Amber Susie, who is uh, our uh, board member, who is a nurse <coughs> and a social media maven and truly participatory. And uh, Amber is going to be uh, uh, giving the uh, .com awards and telling you about that. So Amber, plug in on her.
So the first one is on e-patient principles. We were looking for uh, a person that advocated for self-care, uh, promoted access to use or quality online information, services, and tools to improve the health of individuals and populations, and partnerships between clinicians, uh, patients, caregivers, and families, and serves as an innovator, pioneer, role model, and exemplar um, for genuine collaborative participatory healthcare. So this year's DocTom Award for e-patient principles goes to Susanna Fox. <laughs> that I try to share with the world in my work. Here's a story that I love to tell because it captures one of the key principles, to exist in possibility. When Tom Ferguson, who died of multiple myeloma in 2006, when he was quite ill, bald as a cue ball from chemo, as he put it, he came to DC for a visit. I don't remember the details, but there had been some setback in the e-patient movement some cutting remark by a prominent doubter, some news article that got it all wrong. I asked him how he's able to maintain his sunny optimism. He was smiling even as he was a decade into cancer treatment and four decades into the fight for patient empowerment. I believe that some of his optimism might be genetic, a pioneer entrepreneurial spirit, but his answer took no personal credit. He talked about his Zen practice, his focus on gratitude, and to be here now. To be in the moment at all times is to exist in possibility. My interpretation is that be here now contains the possibility that your reality, your fight, your struggle, your triumph is one that can animate the world. To me, that's what the Society for Participatory Medicine is about. An optimistic and fierce force for good, always based in reality because that's where patients and caregivers must live. We can all be that change we want to see in the world. Thank you.
really brought me here. I mean, he didn't bring me here. I, I became a member of SPM because um, I knew everything about Dave, and I knew that his doctor was here, and I wanted to reproduce this relationship for all of us. I wanted to have primary care for each one of us be like Danny and Dave. So, I'm so. I have, uh, so yeah, we didn't succeed. I tried for years and we can't. This problem is way too big. And yeah, I can't do it with Dave or, or Dan. So anyway, what I wanted to tell you is that I, um, to Regina Hollywood, I got invited to um, have a course in New Media and Health Communications at the College of New Jersey. And <clears throat> as I listen to each one of you today, and as I listen to everyone in SPM. I learned so much that I want every student of mine to be here and listen to you and hear you. And I don't know how to pick what I was thinking right now is, oh my gosh, I want every one of these people to be my guest speakers. And I can only do two or three a semester because the, the students get tired. <laughs> and, and I'm ashamed to look at you and to tell you, oh my gosh, I wish you could my, my guest speaker, because everybody I asked said, yes, please. <laughs> and so I'm sorry if I didn't invite you yet. <laughs> uh, yeah. Thank you so much. I,
So we, we've had a lot of requests uh, for this next number, but we're going to do it anyway. <laughs> you can tell he was a magician, not a... Oh, we're going to move this. <laughs> he was. He was a magician in high school, not a... Uh, let's see. Oh, we got to get this... Um, where's this HDMI thing? <laughs> Oh, there it is. Yes, I knew. My computer does not have built in HDMI, Dr. Oh, it doesn't? No. <laughs> he doesn't believe I know my own body. <laughs> it's over here in the right side. That's it. That's why we are professionals here. Don't try this at home. Oh, oh, yes. It's not the USB-C. This will be worth it, I promise. Just give us a minute. I don't want to promise that. That's yeah, it's well, we'll be promising. It'll be live. I'd rather. At our first conference, we ended spontaneously with. Uh, I don't know if you remember it, but it started with. They say the doc should take the lead, but that's not the kind of doc I need. Well, we're not doing that again. I mean, okay, this is, this is good. Covering. We've, we've, you're, you're family, but we're, we're moving on from here. This year, we're, uh, we're uh, spoiling the memory of Jim Croce. And the second year, I got a busy day. I got a busy life. I never keep leave. I'm not doing this yet. Or get to see my wife. <laughs> doctor, doctor, give me the news. I got a bad case of e patient blues. <laughs> All of this is very, very low in Google search results for um, health, healthcare songs. <laughs> Do we have the, yes, we have the blink of recognition. Oh my God. All that has made us happy. And only pay it. Are you ready? Do you need to No, no, not yet. The audio feed is separate. <laughs> oh, that's right. I learned this. Thank you. Well, no, I'm going to take the audio feed in front of you. Everybody does it today. It's whatever they want to do, and today it's not. By the way, in, in all seriousness, it's a little, it's not just embarrassing, but it's a little off base that so many people have been saying, Dave did this, Dave whatever. All I do, people, have, when I first started giving speeches, a bunch of people said, well, yeah, but Dave's abnormal. My patients aren't like that. They're right well, about seriously, that. if they were. I'm just saying. If, if they, if, have we discussed me being a solo actor? <laughs> if I were the only one, there would be nothing to talk about. What you really need to get I know this thing. Uh, if, 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 there, if I were the only one, there would be nothing to talk about. You need to get that every time you speak up, as many of the stories you've heard today, that's you being what people talk about that Danny and I do. Do more of it. Tell your friends, tell your neighbors, your relatives. That they can do, that they can do this, and maybe someday it maybe might be like Doctor Patient Harmony. Are you right? Oh, <laughs> the line. Where did that come from? Let's see. Is this loud enough, or is it? It's loud. Well, I had just got out from my doctor visit, and do it pretty well. I was in way. Tried to get a sync up with my doctor. Stay up. 
So one of the things that a few of us have talked about doing is creating a version that can be co-branded. I mean, it's a dream for us that people start really distributing this. So we would love to give, be able to give people some kind of file where they can add their own brand logo to it so it can be joined. So that's something that we're gonna work on, which, which uh, we're excited about. Um, uh, if you are not a member, we'd love for you to join. And if your company is a member, we'd love for them to join too. Uh, it just helps build our community even further. And like, we've talked a lot about having conversations, so more members equals more conversation. And uh, that's just something we're looking forward to. And, and the last thing before I hand over to Joe, I, I've been wrestling with this a lot, but I, I really believe in transparency. This is a little painful for me, but I wanted to just at least say it. The Yankees are losing one number. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. What a great event. Thank you all for uh, being here. I want to pick up on one of the comments that Bert just made. Uh, it is $25, and as of November 1st, it back, goes back up, it doubles in price to our usual rate of $50 a month, a year rather. So for the rest of this month, it's $25. If you're not a member, please join. If you want to be involved in some of the work groups, Advocacy, some of you had mentioned, talk to us. I'm going to uh, email all of you. I had mentioned that to uh, most of you, that if you'd like your email shared, uh, let me know. I'm gonna send you one more uh, link to that effect. And with that, this conference is officially closed. 
and reception is going to be right next door. I think they're taking down that wall, but it's right next door. Thank you, everyone. Tear down that wall. Yes, tear down that wall. I, I just also wanted to again thank our sponsors. So thank you to each and every one of you. I appreciate it. But it was also instigated by my mother, who was in a sumo suit, along with my fiance in one as well. So sorry. But this is the conclusion of S4PM 2019. Please feel free to go back and visit that hashtag on all of our outlets and social media. I will post different links to our Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, all of our video content will be trimmed and will be available on YouTube in the coming weeks. So please check back. Have a great day. Thank you.